Hi everyone, my name is James and today I'll be talking about the impact of cache architecture and interface on the performance area of FPGA-based processor parallel accelerator systems. So this uh, work is part of a larger project called Leg Up, as uh, Stefan was previously talking about. It's an open source high-level synthesis tool which compiles C to Verilog. Uh, we target a hybrid processor accelerator system where it comprises of a soft mix processor with uh, hardware accelerators that are generated from Mega. And there's option to also compile the entire program to hardware, which was the method that uh, Stefan was stable. Uh, and it's really downloadable at www.legup.org. So this is the default system uh, target architecture uh, by Lega. You can see the MIPS processor connect to the other components over the Avalon interconnect, which is Altera's bus interface. Uh, the interconnection network here is generated by the SOPC build. So I don't know if you see the colors, but so the MIPS uh, processor communicates the hardware accelerators to start the accelerators, to send over the arguments, uh, to see if they're done and retrieve any return values if necessary. And there are two modes of execution in LIDA. First is the sequential case, where either a, either the processor or a single accelerator can run at a time. Or we can also run them all in parallel, as in this case. And whenever the processor or the accelerator accesses memory, it first goes to the on-chip cache. Now, if it's a cache hit, the data is returned to the requester in a single cycle. And if it's not, then the on-chip cache accesses the off-chip DDR2 memory to burst to, burst to fetch a cache line. Now inside the on-chip cache, there's a dual port memory. Now one port is reserved for the processor as it has different control signals from all of the accelerators. So all of the hardware accelerators end up sharing the second port here. And the arbitration at this point is created by the SOPC builder, which works in a round robin manner. Also note that each accelerator can its can have its own local accelerator memories for any data that is not shared between accelerators or the processor. So this work will be largely talking about that portion of the figure, the onset data cache. We look at how to architect the cache to improve the performance of the application. So the underlying motivation for this work is that we all know off-chain memory access is very slow, and even though that FPGA is just maybe the greatest thing in the world, we cannot avoid this fact. So we can implement caches on FPGAs to reduce memory access times, um, but different cache architectures can bring different results, and application performance can largely depend on the cache architecture and its interface. So with this study, we would like to answer the following question, which is, given multiple accelerators, how, to how should the cache and its interface be architected to maximize application performance? To do this, we use a shared memory model, as shown in the first figure, where there's an on-chip data cache backed by off-chip DDR2 memory. Um, this, the advantage of this method is its simplicity as coherency schemes are not needed, which cause latency in area. But the disadvantage is that contention can exist when multiple accelerators want to access the memory at the same time. But we also look at uh, how to mitigate this fact in the study. In implementing caches, there are properties which are unique to FPGAs. Um, MUXs, are, MUXs take up a lot of area, which can impact at max significantly. And in caches, MUXs are used to select a word from a cache line. So with bigger cache lines, MUXs sizes will also increase as well. Um, they're also used in set associated caches to select between the different sets. Now FPGAs have these on-chip block RAMs which have up to two ports, which means that there can be up to two reads or two writes at any, any given point in time. But what's more interesting is that these on-chip block RAMs can run very fast, and oftentimes much faster than the speed of the overall system. So we take this to our advantage in the system. <coughs> so in this work, we introduced two multi-ported cache designs, first of which is based on the live log table uh, proposed by Eckler Forrest, and second where we use a multi-pumping memory where the memory is clocked at twice the system clock of the system. And using these multi-ported caches, we investigate three traditional cache parameters, which is the cache size, line size, associativity, and to see how they affect uh, performance. Now, there has been quite some work on memory architecture uh, for FPGA-based computing. To list a couple, there's recent work by Jason Kong from UCLA, which partitions the global memory ad address space into different memory banks. And each partition is implemented as its own memory bank, 
so that um, <coughs> to allow uh, multiple access to separate memory banks. Uh, there's another work by uh, Ang from Imperial College, which implements a multi-port cache, also with memory partitioning, and each partition is implemented into a subcache. So this allows multiple concurrent accesses to different subbanks or subcaches, but if they access the same subcache, the accesses have to be serialized. Now we take a different approach from these works in that we don't have to partition the memory uh, space at all. So let's look at how the first multiport cache works. So this was uh, based on the live value table approach, but we actually modified it according to our needs. Uh, and in implementing this as a cache, we were able to reduce the memory consumption to less than half of the original work, which I can talk about more later if anyone has more questions on that. So each one of these memory blocks is a true dual ported memory, so that each port can do either a read or a write. And the idea is that each port has to connect to each other port through one block of memory. So you see here that port 1 connects to port 2 through M1, Port 1 connects to port 3 to M3, and port 1 connects to port 4 to M4. This enables any data that is written by port 1 to be readable by all other ports, and vice versa. So the operation itself is very similar to the original work. Whenever you do a write, let's say port 1 wants to do a write, it will write to all the memory blocks that it's connected to, and it will write to the live value table that for that given address, port 1 is the most recent writer. Now let's say port 2 later wants to read from the same memory address. It will read from all the memories that it's connected to. And it will look up that address in the live value table, which will tell that port 1 is the most recent writer. So it will take the data that is from the memory that is shared with port 1, which is M1 in this case. So we make this into a cache by attaching a memory controller at each one of the ports, which subsequently connects to either a processor or an accelerator. So due to replication, this cache uh, scales with the following equation. And you can see that a four-port cache can be created by 6x amount of uh, memories. And we call this the LVG cache. Now the second approach is based on multi pumping where the memory is pumped at twice the clock speed of the system as you can see in the figure. This also shows a four port cache where the four accesses are divided into two sets. So the first set accesses the memory directly in the first clock cycle of the faster clock, whereas the second set is registered. Now in the second clock cycle of the faster clock, the data will be returned which is saved into a different set of registers. And now the first, now the second set accesses the, the memory. So in the end, at the end of the second clock cycle of the faster clock, all four accesses are done. So from the system's perspective, you can see that four accesses are done in one clock cycle of the faster clock, of the slower clock cycle. And the advantage of this method is that it does not replicate memory size at all because it's one piece of memory. Uh, but it has a caveat that the system has to be slow enough so that the memory can be pumped in twice the clock speed of the system. And we call this the MP cache. So both the LVT and the MP caches allow concurrent access from all of its ports to all regions of memory, or all regions of the cache, sorry, every cycle, which is what differentiates our work from any of the prior works. So using these multi-ported caches, we created five different architectures to be evaluated. The first one is a sequential dual port. This was the default architecture, where a single accelerator is running uh, that performs all the work in the program. Now the second one is the parallel dual port, where there's six parallel accelerators running, but they share one port into the cache. And the third one and the fourth one is a parallel four port, either using one of the LDT or the MP caches. In this case, two accelerators share one port of cache. And the seven port of cache using the LVT. Uh, this one, each accelerator owns its own port of cache. And only the LVT cache can be used for this method because in our system, the MP cache cannot be clocked more than twice the system clock. <laughs> so we used six accelerators for this study because we wanted to vary the amount of contention to the cache 
from very high to medium to none. So you can see also that when the ports are shared, the arbitration is created by the SOPC builders, so it works in a round round manner when they access at the same time. For each one of these architectures, we evaluated 16 different cache configurations, four different cache sizes, and for each cache size, four different line sizes. And as the line size increases, the number of lines in the cache also decreases accordingly. Sorry. And we also evaluated the direct map cache versus two-way set of specific cache. We use nine memory-intensive data parallel benchmarks. And by data parallel, I mean that no two accelerators ever write to the same piece of same, same memory location, but they can read from the same memory location. And each of these benchmarks come from a variety of categories with different input data sizes. We use models and functional simulation to extract the total execution cycles and quarters for area and timing results. This was synthesized for the Stratus 4 on the E4. And with all of the architectures and cache configurations, it took a total of 1,440 model simulations plus quarter synthesis, which probably would have taken until my, at the end of my PhD if I had run it on my computer. But we have access to an amazing piece of machine called Cynet. For those of you who don't know, it's a supercomputer that is maintained by UFT. I believe it's the top 61 in the world right now. Um, and all the results that I'll be showing in the next pages are normalized against the baseline system, which is a sequential system running a single accelerator with a two kilobyte cache, 32 byte line size, and uses a direct map cache. And the results for the baseline system are shown in the table. So let's first look at the geomain execution time. So at the horizontal axis, we see the four different cache sizes. Each cache size shows four different line sizes. And the vertical shows the speed up ratio versus the baseline. You can see that there are 10 different graphs on this page. The top two show the sequential case where a single accelerator is running. This is also connected to a dual port memory. And the parallel dual port case where the six accelerators are connected to one port of memory. This is a four-ported cache using the MP method, four-ported cache using the LVT method, and four seven-ported cache using the LVT method. And the one-way and the two-way indicate the direct map versus set of solicited cache. So you can see that the best result is exhibited by the seven-ported cache with the 6.14x speed up uh, versus the baseline. And the second best result is using the four-port MP cache with the 6.0x speed up, so it comes very closely to the best result. And in the graph, you can clearly see two clusters of data here, with the top cluster showing the data for the multi-ported caches, and the bottom cluster showing the dual-ported caches. And you can see that the perform performance varies a lot with different cache architectures. What's more interesting to note here is that the performance decreases for smaller cache sizes after 64 by line size, and for bigger cache sizes after 128 byte size. So we can see this effect in both in terms of execution cycles and at max. So let's first look at the execution cycles. Similar effect is exhibited here, 64 byte line size for smaller cache sizes. This occurs because there's a lot of conflict misses which occur because too many blocks map onto the same cache line. So for example, for the two kilobyte cache, the 256 byte line size, there's actually only eight cache lines in, in the entire cache. So this makes the probability of the cache line being evicted much higher. So when multiple accelerator access the cache at the same time, this can cause cache thrashing to occur, where the same set of cache lines are continuously evicted and fetched. So this effect is mitigated as you go to bigger cache sizes. You can see for the 16 kilobyte cache, the performance increases with bigger line sizes. Now let's look at the Fmax. You can see that there's a general trend where as we go from bigger cache line sizes, sorry, the Fmax drops. This is because as you increase the line size, the multiplexes which is required to select the work from the cache line increases as well. And the most notable drop is for the two-way set of associated caches because they require the most amount of multiplexing. The muxes are the inputs and outputs of the sets. And within each set, there's a multi-ported caches which require multiplexing as well. 
Let's look at the error results. Shows a similar trend to the fmax. The error increases with bigger line sizes because due to more multiplexes and units. And the biggest areas are shown for the seven ported LVT caches because they have the most amount of replication and each, if, with each replication there's another set of losses introduced. Interesting to note here is that that point there shows the uh, architecture which showed the best result in GeoMain and that shows the second best result so you can see that the error is almost half for the second best result compared to the best result. In terms of memory consumption as expected, the LVT methods uh, increase memory consumption. And for the seven port LVT, the memory blows up the most. Um, this memory consumption shows the total memory of the entire system, which includes a data cache, instruction cache, any local accelerated memories. That's why the ratios are not constant with increasing cache sizes. But note that for all of the MP caches, the memory stays constant. So I'd like to highlight a couple of per benchmark results. You see for the dot product and the histogram benchmarks, the top one shows the worst result for that benchmark. Second one shows the best result. This one shows the best architecture in GeoMean and second best architecture in GeoMean. And only the parallel architectures were considered for this table to isolate any gain from parallelization of the benchmark. So you can see that even between just parallel benchmarks, the speed up can vary very widely. Uh, this is because this architecture has a very big cache thrashing effect as described earlier. And for the histogram benchmark, it doesn't show as much sensitivity to memory, but note that the MP cache actually shows higher uh, speed up than the LBT cache in this method. So in conclusion, you can see that performance varied widely with different cache architectures, and there is no single cache architecture that exhibits the best result in all the cases. And in terms of FPGAs, excessive moxing impact the FMAS significantly, which causes most of the two-way systems to lose in a lot of cases. But uh, multi-pumping does show a very promising results, and even though the 7-point LVT show the best results, uh, the 4-point MP comes very close with approximately half of the area and cache size which is 0.1x smaller. A future work would be to combine this method with the memory partitioning approach to allow a larger number of accelerators and processors. That's it for this talk. Questions? Benchmarks were designed to be very memory intensive, so for, for the other architectures that would show a lot of contention to access the data. Okay, any other? Oh, did you have the miscount to use for missing the cache? Uh, so in our system, it's approximately, I believe it's 24 cycles to fetch the first 20, 256 bits, and then it works on bursts, so every additional cycle after that fetches another 25. 256 bits. Yeah. Okay. And a cache that was a single cycle. Yeah, yes. Okay, great.